على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على منة الولاية وكفى بها منة وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد ورسول المسدد والمصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيبي إله العالمين أبن القاسم محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين سفن النجاة الأعلام من ركب سفينتهم نجا ومن تخلف عنها هلك وغرق ثم أما بعد Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allow me again first and foremost to take this opportunity to offer my heartfelt condolences to Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman Allah ta'ala farajahu sharif on the uh, martyrdom for the darba of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu wa sallamu alayh which marks indeed a very sad and sorrowful event for all Muslims regardless of their background, ethnicity or denominational affiliation. Having said that, allow me also to say that I would like to seek your permission to speak about Imam Ali for this night and for the 21st night and then inshallah I will resume with my topic that I started with yesterday. When a person wants to speak about a personality such as the caliber of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallallahu wa sallam, one must always keep in mind one thing, and this is something I would like to share with you from the outset, and that is, Amir al-Mu'mineen should never be used as a token for separation among Muslims. For Amir al-Mu'mineen is not for one group of Muslims. Nor is he or does he belong to one denomination of Muslims or school of thought of Muslims. In fact, Amir al-Mu'mineen is not the exclusive property of the school of Ahlul Bayt And he is not the exclusive property of Muslims. For Amir al-Mu'mineen is the property of the world and the whole world should understand and appreciate Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallamahu alayhi and the reason for that is that great personalities when you study their life you find them in the exercise of their duty they do not discriminate on the basis of what area or what faith they belong to on the contrary they spread themselves across the board and they reach out to one and all and that is why we find in the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen that when he was once in the company of Qamba his assistant and his servant and they both were observing a phenomena that disturbed Amir al-Mu'mineen when he saw a man age 70 begging in the street of Medina. So the Imam inquired as to why this person has been put in such a predicament upon which Qamba replied and said he is not a Muslim. He is not a Muslim. Upon which Amir al-Mu'mineen inquired and said, then what is he? Kamba replied and he said he is from the members of the Jewish community. Amir al-Mu'mineen then responded and said, then make sure you pay a monthly wages for him to save his dignity and honor from stretching his hand out. Kambar said, Ya Amir al money that is housed and kept in Baytul Man belongs to Muslims. Hmm? This is our mindset. That money that we give out is only for Muslims. Because charity is not deserving for anyone else. 
Yet when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about charity, He speaks about charity to one and all, without discrimination to anyone. So Amir al-Mu'mineen responded to Kamba in a very educational way. He said, oh Kamba, you take taxes from him when he's young and you leave him in the lurch when he is old? And you, you know, these people pay jizya. Jizya means what according to Islamic law? Jizya is a form of, relig uh, is a form of tax that is paid by non-Muslims in order that the Muslim government provide service for them and to exempt them from military service. I am a Muslim. I'm being attacked by a country that don't like Muslims. I don't put Christians and Jews at the forefront. They've got nothing to do with it. Huh? So they are exempt from fighting. They don't fight unless they voluntarily want on the basis of their national affiliation. That's their derogative. Freely, willingly, consensually, if they want to provide this service, then that's up to them. But no Muslim government can force a, a non-Muslim to fight on behalf of a Muslim government. He said, then you take his taxes when he's young and you leave him to beg on the streets when he's old. It is not befitting from an Islamic perspective for something like this to take place. Pay him a monthly wages. How much are we in need for the policies of Ali ibn Abi Talib in today's world that are based in justice? That the policies of Ali ibn Abi Talib forced, forced the United Nations in its 2004 report that was produced in Dubai to list the five or the six governance of laws of governance that Amir al-Mu'mineen gave to Malik al-Ashtar and he said, if you want to ensure justice among leadership and the masses, then you must comply with these six laws of government. That the United Nations says what? If the Arab leadership in the Arab world wants to reconcile with its masses, they must import this, these six laws of governance and apply them within their midst. That's the only solution to the problems that is occurring in the Middle East. And that is a report which is listed, go Google it, and you will find it, and you will see the recommendation that you must follow. That why? Because Ali ibn Abi Talib belongs to a particular community, that Ali ibn Abi Talib for so long has been hijacked by a particular group? No. Ali ibn Abi Talib is the property and the divine given property of every human being on earth. That's why George Jordak, a Christian writer, writes one of the most eloquent books about him, al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib, which is called Ali, the voice of human rights. I quote what this man says in regard to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, have you heard about any kind among the kings? Have you heard about any king among the kings of the world who had the wealth and resources at his disposal, which no other ruler could get and then do? He chooses for himself a life of suffering and sorrows, though he belongs to the noblest of all the clans, and his genealogy was accepted as the most pious among the world. Yet he chooses to live among the very ordinary. And he explains and exclaims himself, should people say, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib lives a life of luxury while there are subjects in his government that cannot afford a meal a day. It is not befitting for Ali ibn Abi Talib to escalate his rank to a position simply so that people will say Amir al-Mu'mineen came and Amir al-Mu'mineen went. He says, no, I must equate myself with the rest of the community, unless or until the rest of the community is in a position to find itself 
three meals a day, then Ali ibn Abi Talib will eat three meals a day. But as long as there is no one, or there is someone in the community that cannot afford this, then Ali ibn Abi Talib must equate himself to these people. In Safin, Ali ibn Abi Talib is seen eating dry bread. So one of his you know, soldiers wants to emulate Ali ibn Abi Talib. So he goes and he brings some dry bread and he begins to eat dry bread. So Amir al-Mu'mineen says, is there white bread in the camp? He says, yes, go and eat white bread. Ajeeb. That man says, but you are eating brown bread. And by the way, according to the addition, these days brown bread is better than white bread. But anyway, so you are eating brown dry bread. Why are you telling me to eat white bread? So Amir al-Mu'mineen says, because I am in a position of leadership. I have to equate myself with those who are the most less fortunate in my community. But as far as you are concerned, enjoy life. Enjoy it. Enjoy it until I sustain my community and bring them to a level where they become standard in their what? In their needs of everyday life. So Amir al-Mu'mineen was trying to eliminate the class system. Amir al-Mu'mineen was trying to eliminate poverty. Amir al-Mu'mineen is the one that his words echo 1400 years ago until now in the ears of every poor person in which he says, if poverty was a man, I would have called that man to combat in order to eliminate him so that there will be no poverty in the world. And elimination of poverty is not something difficult, brothers and sisters. Small calculation of how poverty can be eliminated and you'll appreciate that it doesn't take the whole world economy around the world to resolve or to solve the problem of poverty. Muslims themselves, if they leave aside their hypocritical standards, they will be able to sustain the whole world. Take Hajj, for example. Each year we have 5.8 people performing Hajj on average. Among the 5.8 people of performing Hajj, only 1.8 or 1.2 are performing Hajj for the first time, which is Hujjat al-Islam, right? How many left who are performing Hajj for the second time, the third time, or the fourth time, or the sixth time? 5 million, or 4.8 million, right? Because we have 5.8, 1.2, so we have about 4.8 million performing Hajj, second or third time. Average cost of Hajj is how much? 5,000. Average cost of Hajj, 5,000. 5,000 times 4.8 million is how much? Vicinity of 50. How much? How much? 30 billion dollars every Muslims are wasting. I know I will be attacked. I know someone said, oh, what are you talking about? Hajj, Habibi. You know what Hajj? Yes, I know it's the washing machine where people go to wipe off their sins after they've done it throughout the year. Now the chance come for a washing machine, right? But look what Imam al-Baqir says in his wasiyah to his community. When a person comes to him and says, Oh, son of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Shias are many today. He says, tell me something. Do these Shias look after one another? He says, no. He said, does this, the, the, the healthy one among them visit the sick one among them? He said, no. He said, does the one who is fallen under debt find someone to alleviate his debt? He says, no. He says, does anyone among them, when he feels that God has bestowed money among him, will go searching for the poor to give him part of his wealth? He says, no. He said, then let me tell you something. Then let me tell you something. By Allah, our true followers are the ones who are always conscious of Allah in regard to others. 
not about themselves. Huh? I don't want to be exclusive in my worship. I want to do the amals of Laylatul Qadr. So Ya Allah, bring your mercy just in this phenomenon where I'm standing. Don't let your mercy go an inch to the right or an inch to the left. No, 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 just where I'm standing. Allahumma firli dhunubi. Oh Allah, forgive me my sins. Oh Allah, grant me wealth to me. Oh Allah, give me. That's exclusiveness. Allah says be inclusive. When you want to ask, ask for others before you ask for yourself. Because Allah says, by my glory and majesty, if you remember your brother in dua without him knowing that you are supplicating for him, I shall respond to you first. Because you are not more generous than I am that you remember someone else and I forget you. Allah Akbar. This is God. And this is how we should relate to God. Because the Prophet says what? Bring within your life and moral system the attributes of Allah. Rasulullah says, behave with the attributes of Allah. Of Allah is what? Al Afu. The pardoning. Pardon your next door neighbor. Huh? Pardon your mother in law. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, uh. No way. My mother in law? The snake? <laughs> Why is the concept of mothers in law always associated with snakes? <laughs> Yet we have an excellent example of a role model of a mother in law that mothers in law should follow and daughters in law should follow. And that is Ummul Benin. She was a stepmother, right? A stepmother. Imam Hassan and Hussein were not her kids. Zainab was not her daughter. Um Kulthum was not related to her. But they were the children of Amir al Mu'mineen. Yet on her wedding night, she comes to the home. She does not take over the whole setup. Huh? She's not now the ruler of the house. She says to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Salamullah alayhi, go and ask permission from these children if they will accept me in their house. This is humanity at its best. Hmm? Because they are my imams. And someone says, ah, but these uh, stepkids are not my imams. Okay, forget the fact that they are not your imams. Aren't they human beings? They don't have feelings. You cannot just shun their feelings away and take them away from them. She goes in, Amir al-Mu'minin says, Fatima this, Fatima that, because she's Fatima bin Huza al-Kilabi, right? That's her first name. He said, Amir al-Mu'minin, this name is not fit for me. Change it. Why oh Fatima? Because every time I look at the eyes of Hassan and Hussein, Zainab and Um Kulthum, I see tears in their eyes. They are remembering their mother Fatima salamu alayhi I don't want that. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, then you are surely Umm al You are the mother of children that knows how to look after people's kids. Right? And a mother-in-law is a second mother. She should have that affinity. That when a daughter-in-law comes into your premises, treat her as your own daughter. Reciprocate that respect between you and her, and her and you. Huh? Be the initiator of good, like the Prophet said, Isma'il ma'roofa ma' ahli wa ma' ghayri ahli. Qalu kayfa dalika ya Rasulullah. The Prophet says what? Do good with those who deserve it and those who don't deserve it. Here, yeah, brothers, you are talking to Arab mentality. You know what Arab mentality means? These people inherited wars as part of their assets. You know, you leave for your children a Bentley. You leave for your children a house. But you don't leave your child with a war to, as a part of inheritance to continue the legacy. These Arabs left battles for the children to continue. And now the Prophet is telling them, you should do good to those who hurt you. And those who are good to you, it doesn't sit right. But the Prophet
Prophet wanted to create a shift in paradigm of thinking. Right? So they asked the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, how do you expect us to do good with those who don't deserve it? The Prophet found a golden opportunity to respond. He said, when you do good to those who deserve it, on what basis do you do it? The Arab said, on the basis that they are good. He said, good. Excellent. So why can't you extend this goodness to those who don't deserve it? That's what they exclaimed. They said, because they don't deserve it. Here comes the bombshell. Here comes the shift in paradigm. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, if they don't deserve it, why don't you initiate good on the basis that you are good and you deserve it? Allahu Akbar. Why wait for someone to say salamu alaykum to you? You take the first step. Rasulullah is the one that says that initiating salam or salam itself comes in 70 parts. Right? The initiator of salam gets 69 out of 70. Well, the replier gets 1%. And I want to wait for everyone to come and say to me, Salaamun Alaikum. And you miss on 69 parts just because of my arrogance? Just because I have to be told Salaamun Alaikum first? Where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to walk in the streets of Medina the word salam never used to leave his mouth. Whoever he would say, whoever he would see, he would initiate the salam first, even if there were kids playing in the streets of Medina. Right? Ahna Muslims, sometimes we don't want to even say salam alaykum to our wives. Huh? Even to our kids. And we demand respect when respect should be given first. Right? How do I raise my kids? I want my kid to respect me. I have to respect him first. With a classical example of that is the practice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Ahlul Bayt sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell me something. Why do you think Amir al-Mu'mineen, whenever he would see his daughter Fatima sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would take to his feet and stand up? This ariwaya, kafi, kulayni, as-saduq, you know, man la yahkuru al-faqih, all these books of hadith, they relate, relate to us. Even Muslim, Bukhari, Ibn Majah, Tirmidhi, Malik, all the school of thought of our Sunni brothers, they relate to us that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without fail, every time he would see a Zahra approaching him, he would take to his feet in respect to her, take his hand, take her hand, kiss it, and he will make her sit in his place. What is the reciprocal wrong? What happened after that? And every time Fatima would see her father coming, she would stand up, kiss his hand, and give him her seat in reciprocal agreement. Okay. And I want my son to respect me and to honor me. Well, I am not in a position to respect him and honor him first. Where is that respect going to come from? I want my son not to tell lies. Right? And someone calls, Salamun Alaikum, Baba home? Baba, someone calling. <laughs> hmm? Uncle, Baba is not home, sorry, Salamun Alaikum. Right? The next day, the father asks that very same son, Where were you yesterday? He says, I was at my aunt's house. He says, No, look, don't tell me lies. Because yesterday I went to your aunt, uh, uh, house and I asked her, did my son come to you? And she said, no, you did not. Where do you learn lying from? The son looks at him and says, from the master. <laughs> from the master, from the one who told me yesterday. No, I'm not around. Or oh, the ones that they don't want to lie. But they don't want, they want their children to use what we call metaphorical lies. What is that metaphorical lies? When someone comes to the door and I am inside the house, point to a different position and say, Baba is not here. But he's inside. Haji. What sort of lies is this? What sort of tricks are these? Well, this is not the standard of Ahlul Bayt. 
Salamullahi alayhim or the Prophet Salamullahi wa salamu alayhim. No wonder sometimes why our kids when they come to us, especially in the West for example, and they say, you know, I'm giving up on Islam, I don't want to know this way. Why Habibi, what bothers you? He says, I cannot stand the double standards of my parents. I cannot stand it. This is not an attack on anyone. Because if anything I'm saying, I'm addressing myself because I'm a parent. Right? Well, I'm a parent with a list of kids, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Six daughters and one son. Yeah. So I have to administer within my own setup that example. I have to respect my daughters. I have to honor my son. I have to honor the ones that I share my life with. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ahlul Bayt had excellent examples of how they reported to one another. Ali Zayn al-Abideen, salamullah alayhi, once was with his servants. He had an orchard, Amir uh, Ali Zayn al-Abideen. He used to go to that orchard and he used to cultivate that orchard. One day, every now and then, these workers would mess up. They would slip. They would do something against the, the instructions of Ali Zayn al-Abideen. At the end of the month, he would collect them. Come, come, let's discuss. Let's have a debriefing. Not with a stick. Debriefing with verbal communication. Huh? Let's debrief. Let's talk about what happened. Didn't you do this on that and that day? Yes, Ibn Rasul. I did. He goes to the next servant or worker. Did you do this? Yes. Where my instructions, so and so? Yes. Did you comply with my instruction? No, I didn't comply with your uh, instruction. He would list everything. And they will admit their mistakes. Look what Ali Zayl Abidin would do. He would say, okay, stand behind me. They stand in rows. This is a riwaya, authentic riwaya. They stand in rows. He said, raise your hand towards heaven. They would raise. He says, oh Allah, in as much as I have forgiven them, Say Ameen. They would say Ameen. Now you say to Allah, Oh Allah, forgive Ali Zayd al Abidin. Huh? Not ostracize them. Not kill them. Not hit them. Not bring them outside the fold of your life. No, he says, Now call, call on Allah. The way I pardon you, tell Allah to pardon Ali Zayd al Abidin. For what to pardon Ali Zayd al Abidin? What wrong has Ali Zayd al Abidin done? So Allah would pardon him. Huh? No, so that those who will come after Ali Zayn al Abidin would learn the akhlaq of Ali Zayn al Abidin. And they would know how to deal with people in their community and in their society. Even if people happen to be against you, don't deprive them of your love and of your earnest acceptance within your heart and rank. Look at Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi, what he says in regard to brothers that you connect with or brothers that you don't even connect with. Yani your brothers in faith and your brothers in humanity. Look what he says. He says, oblige your brother by warning them, correct them by showing and giving them favors. Yani if you want to highlight the fault of someone, before you accuse him, first put him on a pedestal of recognition first, so that he could listen to you. Rasulullah was in the mosque once, delivering a speech. A man comes and he starts going over the shoulders of people. You know, it was a full mosque, like, you know, this defense Imam Barga today, mashallah. I've never seen so many people in my life in an Imam Barga. Huh? So people are praying rows after rows. This man comes, he started jumping rows. Why? Because he wants to sit in front of the Prophet and listen to him very at a very close distance. Look what the Prophet says. He says, I am mesmerized at your love and thirst for knowledge. Because you were coming and hurrying up. But don't do this next time. Because it's not befitting to come over the shoulders of people. Now this man, at the spare of the moment, he did not hear the next statement. Huh? He heard the statement which was full of praise. I love your quest for knowledge. Now when he goes home, he says, oh, huh? but the prophet said, don't do this again. Oh, wow. Then I should reconsider my position. But now the Prophet did not put him down. He raised him. He raised him. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Before you accuse your brother, 
solicit on his behalf 70 different excuses. Before you launch your rocket, you know, launches, before we have this, you know, RBJ M7, I don't know what, of accusation coming out from, no, no, he said, calm down, solicit some, you know, there was a community member in our community once, this is how Imam Ali Sallallahu teaches us how to solicit pardons and excuses on behalf of our brothers so that we can grow as a community. What he said, this community member, I know a person, is a friend of mine. One day another person comes and says, Sheikh, you know this friend of yours, Abu so and so? You know the father of so and so, Arabs call, they don't call people by their first name, they call Abu Muhammad, father of Muhammad, Abu Naushad. For example, Abu Nazir, you know, Abu Hussein, whatever. He said, yes, what's with Abu Hussein or Abu X? He said, yesterday he was seen coming out of a pub. And this guy prays behind you. And he pretends to be, mashallah, Ali ibn Abi Bad. Huh? Who is the one that initiated? Amman yujibu al-muttarra idha da'a. This is the man? I said, wait. Wait, let us find out what's going on. So Abu X comes. He was not in front of him. I take him aside. Abu X, what's going on? He says, I know it was going to come. I know. It's already reached you. Goodness me. These people have satellites on their cars. It already reached you. When did they see me? I said, what the news travel? He said, by Allah, and tears starts coming out of his eyes. The man. Man, man, he's old. He's not young. Tears starts coming out of his eyes. I said, then, kullu ibn Adam khatta. All the children of Adam make mistakes. Save the ones who have been saved from mistakes. And he asked all people. We are prone to making mistakes. We sleep. We make mistakes. He said, Wallah, Sheikh, I was in that road at that particular time. My car stopped. I was, it broke down. I put my hand in my pocket. I couldn't find my phone. The only shop was open at that time was the pub. I only went inside to use the phone. Allah is my witness. Straight away, we are telling this guy, He's already had Johnny Walker black label, red label, oh, I don't know, Bombay blue, God knows what. Allahu Akbar. <coughs> Did you see him? Huh? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, you know what he says? He says, between truth and falsehood, the distance of four fingers. Four. They said, how you have it? He said, what you hear is falsehood. What you see with your own eyes is or amounts to truth. Four fingers. Does it take that much to take that, you know, uh, hard work to verify the news? Huh? No. Be within the limits and the parameters of soliciting excuses for your brothers. Don't accuse them. Then Amir al-Mu'minin says the following. What does he say? He said, you should tie the knot of love and affection with your brother, remembering that your brother is not strong enough to break the knot, nor is he capable of harming you. Because harm only comes and good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not capable. Huh? So don't allow him to be in a position to be capable to hurt you. No. I often say, brothers and sisters, even when we want to discuss issues of differences, whatever the differences may be, what should be our intention from the outset? Scoring a point against that person or winning his heart? What do I want? If it is about scoring a point, you've lost that person completely. But if it's about winning his heart, even if you don't score the point one day, he will find the point himself that you are trying to raise. In Safin, Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi, comes out and he hears his, you know, some of his army members making la'an on the other group. La'an this, mu'aw, this, mu'aw. He said, well, I 
detest for you to curse others. They said, Ya Rabbi Mu'minin, they're cursing us. He said, yes, highlight their problems. Highlight their mistakes. Let people be in a position of listening to their mistakes and problems and let them analyze it. Then they will reach the truth. They will arrive at the truth. You go into a black night, sorry, a black room, a dark room. If you stand in that dark room with a stick for 24 hours, beating the hell out of that darkness, will darkness go out? It won't. But with a simple candle that you lit up, all the darkness will leave that room. Single candle. Right? I want to eliminate darkness from the hearts and the minds of people. Put the truth on the table. Place the facts. Say this is what happened. And this is where we're going. And we are brothers at the end of the day. Let us reconcile our difference. Let us be like Ali ibn Abi Talib when he himself said, I shall surrender for as long as the affairs of Muslims remain intact. I shall surrender. I shall give up on certain things for as long as Islam remains intact. For as long as the Muslim Brotherhood, Hadari, Hadari means what in Arabic? I give my earnest, earnest, heartfelt, cautious for us to use Amir al-Mu'mineen as a token of separation between Muslims. Because Amir al-Mu'mineen is nothing other the pivotal and the axis of unity for Muslims. Because he was the standard bearer of unity. Salam alaikum. He was the standard bearer of unity. And no one can deny that fact that Amir al-Mu'mineen was the standard bearer after the Prophet who threw out the first three or four reigns that followed the Prophet who during his reign, Salawatullah wa salamu he was always calling for brotherhood and unity and bringing Muslims together. So much so that he said in that statement that I read before you, La usalimanna ma salimat umur al-Muslimin, I shall surrender for as long as the affairs of the Muslims remain intact. Though, 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 with a bold line under the word though, that I know I am personally suffering at the account or at the expense of that unity. I am the one who's suffering. I am personally taking account of all this suffering. But what makes me feel happy is that I still can see Islam intact. And we should work towards that. I mean, tell me, in, in a logical sense, forget religion, forget culture, forget tradition, forget in a logical sense, which is better, to have more friends or more enemies? Logically. Doesn't take a genius to tell us that. Surely to have less friends, less enemies and more friends, right? And the oldest brothers and sisters that I say that with utmost, utmost, utmost heart-to-heart -heart communication. The onus on reaching out to anyone starts within us. We are the one that must reach out. Huh? We are the one that needs to go out and reach out to everyone and say, what's the matter with you people? Huh? We are one and the same. Let's differ, but let's differ with dignity. Let's differ, but let us differ with honesty. Let us differ, but let us differ with respect. People used to come to, uh, to Ja'far al-Saliq, salamu and they used to say, Abu Hanifa used to come in the majlis of, Amir, uh, of, of Imam Ja'far al-Saliq. He used to say, Oh Imam, what do you say in this mas'ala? What do you say about this mas'ala? Imam Ja'far al-Saliq would not dismiss him. He would not say, you're worthless. No, he says, you Abu Hanifa and the people of Iraq say this. The people of Basra say this. The people of Hijaz say this. And our opinion is this. Now, he highlights all the opinions, right? And then he says, our opinion is this. Now you tell me which is the truth. And follow it. Huh? What would Abu Hanifa reply to Imam Ja'far al-Sariq, 
he would say, we have said in the past, and I shall repeat my statement now, that the most learned among the people is the one who is most learned among their various opinions. The one who knows. The one who knows about what others know, and what others believe, and what others are endowed with. So that when I speak to them, I know how to relate to what they are saying. And from what perspective and from what dimension they are talking. Don't forget history, brothers and sisters, has messed up our brains. In as far as what happened to Muslims in the course of history, it has messed up our brains in regard to what happened. And don't forget the campaign of fabrication during that, you know, 1400 years ago was worse than Fox News. Worse, worse. Huh? You think Fox News is something? Oh, it's nothing when it comes to the discrepancies and the fabrication that took place within the Muslim era and the Muslim, you know, uh, uh, history. That's why we need to step outside the box a little bit and look at the Muslim world from an, from an eye bird view to see how we can look at our problems and resolve them. You know, and Amir al-Mu'mineen till the last day he was fighting for this. He never gave up on his principles. He is the one who said, I shall never foster compromise on the basis of weakening my faith. No, I don't foster compromise. But I will say the truth in its best formalized academic approach. So that I can win the hearts of my opponent. I can win the heart of my opponent because I don't want to lose my opponent. I want to win my opponent. Hmm? Rasulullah I will conclude with Messiah. Rasulullah used to go out once there is a riwayah that the Prophet was in the mosque and he heard of a Jewish funeral coming. So he came out, he stood. The companions look at him, Ya Rasulullah, what are you doing? What are you doing? He said, I'm standing because this is life lost. Ajeeb. Ajeeb. This is life lost. Huh? So they said, and you stand up for that person? You know, to them it is as if trash, you know, in a better comment. You know, you're standing up for this person? He said, yes. Why, Ya Rasulullah? They said, because I was not quick enough to reach him. I was not quick enough to reach him so that I can lend my heart to him, so that I can tell him what is Allah, what is Rasulullah, what is Islam, what Allah wants from you, why are you on this earth, what can you do so that you can become a better human being. So I was not quick enough to reach him, but I leave it in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I leave it. So your opponent could be a potential friend, brothers and sisters. And that's why we say often in our quest of teaching our students and our children, when you look at any human being out there, no matter what denomination he comes from and what background he comes from, always look at him as a potential Muslim, not as a potential enemy. Because you never know when Hidayah can come. Because Allah is the one who is in doubt with Hidayah, right? So why, why look at him differently other than the fact that he could be a potential brother standing next to you on your rank of Salah one day, right? Or a sister or anyone for that thing. And that was what Amir al-Mu'mineen was about. Inshallah, I don't have time to continue about Amir al-Mu'mineen today, but I'll take your leave to read the Masayib about Amir al-Mu'mineen and we'll continue about the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen when we come to the question of the night of the 21st. Sallallahu alayka ya Rasulallah Sallallahu alayka ya Aba Abdillah Wa ala al-arwah al-lati hallat bi finaik wa ala khat bi rahlik عليك منا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار 
ولا جعله الله آخر العهد منا لزيارتكم when it was the 19th night brothers and sisters Amirul Mu'mineen Salawatullahi wa salamu alayh left the house of Umm Kulthum but look what happened at the house of Umm Kulthum Amirul Mu'mineen sits down briefly to have his iftar and then Umm Kulthum presents Amirul Mu'mineen that night with three items of food on his table Amir al-Mu'mineen, in a loving, fatherly way, looks at Umm Kulthum. He says, Oh, Umm Kulthum, when do you know your dad breaks his fast on three items of food? When? It was never his practice, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi, to break his fast on three items of food. And this is Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the head of 22 different states at his time. The head of 22 different states at his time. She said, Baba, it's Ramadan. It's fasting. You are tired. The affairs of Muslims on your back. He said, take one out. I only make a far on two items. Take one out. And you know, the most surprising thing is that what she offered him does not warrant a complaint. Because she offered him salt, water, and lemon. And he salt, water, and milk. He said, take one item out. <laughs> Baba, these are three drinks. Huh? Three drinks. You cannot break your fast on three. He said, take one out. Take, take the water, take the milk with the date. Leave me just two items. Breaks his fast, he leaves. Someone by the name of S. Oakley, he's a historian, reports about Amir al he says, when Amir al-Mu'minin was about to exit the door of Umm Kulthum house, he had pigeons and uh, swans and, uh, you know, ducks in the house. They started flapping their wings. The servant came to calm these birds down. Amir al-Mu'minin said, leave them, leave them, for they are announcing the departure of their master, Ali. Salawatullahi wa Leave them. Leave them lament the departure of Ali ibn Abi Talib Ali exits. When he was exiting the door, you know, he was wearing what we call, you call longi? Longi, huh? Yeah? That, uh, he was wearing that and he had tied it with a belt according to history. The belt came undone and the door would not open. Subhanallah. The door doesn't want. It is like the door knows that he doesn't want Ali ibn Abi Talib to leave that night, the night of the 19th. So he pulls the door ajar with a bit of force, the belt comes undone. Look what Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Ushdud hayazimaka lil mawti fa inna al mawta la fika ya 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 Tighten your belts o alayhi for surely death is going to meet you. For if life one day gave you a smile, surely this very life will make you cry. There is no escape of death, O Ali. There is no escape. If one day you smile, one day you will cry. And Ali goes to the mosque. Surprisingly, that night Ali says to Hassan Hussein, don't come out. Leave. Stay at home and pray your Fajr namaz at home. He goes, Ali ibn Abi Talib, finds his killer lying down on his stomach. This is the humanity of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He shakes him. He says, oh, Ibn Muljam, my beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told me, sleeping on your stomach is not good. Either sleep on your right hand side and that is the sleeping of a mu'min. Or sleep on your back and that is the type of sleeping of the Prophet. But don't sleep on your stomach. So he turns him. And as a father turning his infant child, knowingly that he will soon kill Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salawat Allah wa salam Offers his fajr and adhan and then stands in the prayer. Goes into his ruku' salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh saying Subhana Rabbiyal Azeem Subhana Rabbiyal A'la wa bihamdeh Praising the name of his Lord 
while Ali was in sajda, Ibn Muljam takes out his sword. Go all close to Amir al Mu'minin, strikes Amir al Mu'minin on his head. The blood comes, drenches the beat of Amir al Mu'minin. Amir al Mu'minin says, My beloved Rasul told me, O oh, Ali, when will this be drenched? from this pointing to his head and this is the moment Ali faces the predicament of death and the prophecy of Rasulullah then he looks towards heaven he cries out saying by Allah I have scored a great triumph Fusto wa Rabba but the question is, brothers and sisters, that Amir al Mu'mineen gets transported home. He stays three nights in the laps of Hassan and his children. His children come to him, they comfort him, they are around him. But woe on my heart and mind, who was there for Hussein Salamullah alayhi? When he fought, had fallen on the plains of Karbala and momentarily before he fell, his brother Al Abbas had fallen down. Amir al Mu'mineen comes to him, Hussein ibn Ali comes to him, and he places his head in his lap. Al Abbas takes his head and places it on the ground. Imam Hussein says, Why are you taking my head away? Why are you taking your head away and putting it on the floor? Al Abbas recalls and says, Oh Hussein, soon you will fall on the plains of Karbala and there will be no one to come and place your head in his lap. Huh? Who will put your head in his lap? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أيام قد إن ينقلبون وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين May Allah have mercy on those who recite Surah Al-Mubarakah Al-Fatiha proceeded with salawat on Muhammad وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد